Yeah, sure. So we set up MacroHive around 2019, so we're around four years old, and we basically produce research analytics for investors around the world, more on the institutional side, so some of the top hedge funds in the world, some of the top banks and asset managers. Before that, I used to run research at Deutsche Bank, the investment bank, and at Nomura. I started off in finance in the, in the late 1990s, so I've been around the, a while, like 25 years, uh, looking at cross assets, so FX rates, uh, equities, top down macros, essentially. It did look like at the start of this year that the Fed were going to go in March because inflation had fallen a lot. So it seemed like the Fed just cared about inflation. But what's happened since then, since the start of January, is that the data has turned out to be really quite strong. But it's retail sales, but it's non farm payrolls that came out last Friday, the economic strength is very, very strong. At the same time, if you look at the inflation data, that's ticked up as well. And so the backdrop to the Fed meeting was one where things were turning up, both in the inflation side and the growth side. And essentially, uh, Powell at the Fed uh, press conference suggested that uh, March is off the table. He also gave an interview over the weekend as well, where he indicated that March is very unlikely to happen. So this means that the Fed's first cut is likely to be later, you know, May or, or June, uh, subsequent meetings after, after March. Uh, of course, it depends on the data in between, but at least for now, March seems very, very unlikely. Sure. So if you look at the inflation rate in the US, it's CPI, which is the common measure that people look at. Um, within that, the biggest drop has really come from the good side, whether it's energy prices or just goods in general, the stuff you buy on Amazon and such. So that's fallen a lot um, over the past six months or so. The question is whether that continues to drop, because that's the one that moves the fastest. Um, so on that basis, our view is that um, on the energy side, we're actually fairly neutral on energy prices right now. We have slight bullish bias. Um, our view there is on the, on the Middle East conflict side. I think people overstate the risks of the Middle East for oil prices themselves because the key thing here is whether the conflict starts to engulf the production lines themselves, Saudi Arabia, for example, or uh, Kuwait or Qatar on the, on the natural gas side. And that's at this stage unlikely to happen. What could happen is that you could have uh, a missile strike against uh, accidentally hitting uh, a tanker. You know, the carrying oil that sort of spills over or something like that. So there's, there's of course, that type of risk. But overall, our sense is, in terms of the Middle East conflict, it's, it's contained uh, in the sense that it's not affecting oil supply themselves. Um, now, the OPEC cuts are more significant, so that's more important that there are cuts happening, and that could lead to upside, some upside pressure on oil. But we don't necessarily think there'll be a surge in oil prices. So that means that that source of um, inflation is, is unlikely to be there. So on balance, then, poor goods, our view is that that's going to, going to fall, but probably not as much as before. We need to watch oil. Then the services side of inflation is driven more by the broader economy, and our view on the economy is it's fairly strong mm -hmm. overall. So my sense is the inflation picture um, won't be as positive in the next three, four months. I, uh, it won't fall as much as people think, which, which suggests that the Fed will push Fed cuts further out. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we think you know, the economy is doing very well. You know, employment is very strong in the US, wages are picking up, um, house prices even are starting to turn up as well. So the economic picture in the US is fairly robust. Um, so again, that's another factor that sort of suggests that the Fed will, will be able to wait a bit before they start to cut rates. Yeah, I mean, in, in the end, this really comes down to the AI and the Magnificent 7 play. And essentially, the outperformance in US stocks is really heavily concentrated to a few big tech companies. And not, not even just the Magnificent 7 anymore, it's getting even more narrower than that. So these have really pulled up the overall performance of the S&P. So if you look at the S&P excluding the big tech companies, it hasn't actually performed that well. If you look at the Russell 2000, you know, broader index of small cap, that's actually gone sideways, broadly speaking. So this tells you that the, the overall index is really driven by big tech, which in turn is driven partly by the AI story, because big tech companies are, are driving the AI story. And it's also driven by the fact that their earnings in general have been really quite strong. Mm -hmm. And there's a push, a move to quality, and these companies are, are those as, as well. Um, so that's a general backdrop. My sense is that, you know, I think that the tech story probably has a bit further to go, um, but, you know, valuations are getting quite stretched. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Um, and the AI theme itself, it's hard to know when the theme will run out of steam completely. Um, uh, so I think that probably could last for the whole year. It's just very hard to predict when, when that thing will sort of turn down. Certainly when I speak to clients, everybody is trying to implement some kind of AI strategy of some sort. So, so that tells me that maybe that, has, that could actually last the year.
Yeah, I mean, I think on the on the bond side, I think that bonds could struggle in the short term. So bond yields could go up to with what to set, you know, so bond prices will go down. Um, I think that, at least in the short term, that's certainly the direction I think we would expect. At the same time, if the Fed will cut rates this year, that's going to push yields lower. Yeah. So overall, my, my way of looking at this year is more like trading ranges of the course of this mm-hmm. year, um, course by quarter. So right now, I think we're in uh, an environment where yields will go up. Um, so one wants to be in that environment, uh, short bonds. Um, and same on the dollar as well. I think right now we're in a bullish dollar environment because the US economy is doing well, the rest of the world is not doing as well, so that's a bullish dollar environment. But then at the same time, I don't think it's, it's necessarily a trend. Yeah, I think the Bank of England will cut rates this year, just like the Fed. Um, and I think the challenge with the UK is that for a while now, the pictures look quite bleak for the UK in terms of the pass-through of high interest rates and mortgages and then actually impact household spending. For whatever reason, that hasn't happened as much as people thought. So the US, the UK economy has actually held up relatively well. And earlier uh, today, we had a fairly uh, positive revisions to labor market data in the UK, which suggests that the labor market is stronger than, than initially anticipated. So for some reason, for whatever reason, the UK economy is doing, doing well overall. Um, part of that, I think, is to do with how strong the labor market is. Mm-hmm. So people have jobs, they aren't losing their jobs, wages are picking up, so that means high interest rates aren't affecting them uh, as much as before. Um, but overall, my sense is that in the end, the higher mortgage rates will you know, chip away at people's purchasing power. And so that means that the economy will weaken. Inflation is on the high side in the UK, um, and that's partly driven by sort of historic energy price increases, Brexit, things like that. Um, but that is also coming down a bit as well. Um, so my sense is the bank probably will start to cut rates in May. Um, there's a chance it may delay it a bit, um, but but you know we're we're in that zone at the moment. Yeah, consumer staples have certainly done done quite well overall, um, and that just goes to you know number one, it's it's you can say it's a bit more defensive than say consumer discretionary, um, and at the same time um, the yield in that uh, sector is relatively attractive compared to other sectors as well. So I think it's a good mix between the defensive without necessarily being too recessionary. It, it's, it's a good kind of middle road to play. Um, more generally, I think that uh, a move towards quality makes a lot of sense, and that helps many different sort of sectors. Um, so that helps some tech. Um, it also helps um, uh, some investment companies as well, uh, capital equipment, things like that. Um, so that's my sense is kind of those sectors will generally do quite well. Because I think there's, there's a couple of overall themes. One is there's a push to quality. You know, as people get worried about, you know, uh, sort of a potential slowdown in the economy uh, later on. Um, and, and then also there's there's certain longer term things. So, for example, in the US, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, which is leading to much more investment in, in the UK, in the US economy, more factory building. So that leads to a pick up in capital equipment. Um, then there's the energy transition as well, which is leading to investments as well. So that's a benefit sector associated with that. Yeah, on the chart side, I think there's a couple of really, really interesting charts. You know, one I think is uh, if you look at the U.S. yield curve and the level of inflation uh, and the level of debt in the U.S., that just seems like it doesn't doesn't make sense. Uh, in the sense that normally when you have high levels of debt and relatively high levels of inflation, what you should see is a steep yield curve, mm-hmm. which means that ten-year yields should be higher than two-year yields. Historically, that's almost always been the case. That that's a really wide gap. And so at some point, something's going to give, um, unless there's some new paradigm that, we, we, that we're not uh, aware of. The other one is, more generally, what you find is that the goods sector, uh, whatever measure of goods you want to look at, manufacturing sector, um, you know, um, durable goods, those sorts of things, versus the service sector, there's been this dichotomy between the two. The service sector overall has been holding up quite well, whereas the goods sector has been relatively weak. Um, and so that's also something that's quite important, and that goes to one of the challenges we're all facing, which is that since COVID, the economy split into two, and those two economies have been, um, their cycles have moved in a different way, they've been desynchronized in essence. Um, and that makes it harder to call the cycle because if you look at the goods sector, it looks a bit more recessionary. But then you look at the service sector, if you look at restaurants, it looks like they're booming and, and it, it looks like a contradiction. But it's just the nature of the COVID shock is such that it desynchronized the, mm-hmm. the economy. So that's, that's another one that I'll. I'd look at. Um, and then the other one I think is if you look at say something like um, US 10 year yields and say the dollar, you know, US 10 year yields recently have fallen quite significantly, um, although last 
a few days has picked up. But the dollar is, you know, hasn't fallen as much, so that's interesting as well. That could be because the rest of the world yields have fallen, but you know, that, that's quite a wide gap between the two. Um, yeah, my take is at least for this year, we're going to have a soft landing defined uh, as no recession mm-hmm. this year. Um, uh, so that's my sense of this year at least. I think for us to see a recession this year, you, you really need to have some kind of external shock, whether it's an oil price spike, some kind of banking crisis that engulfs the whole economy, you know, some, something like that for, for that to happen. In the absence of that, the, the thing that could cause um, a recession is if inflation suddenly picks up a lot and the Fed starts to hike again. Um, and then suddenly that causes a recession. Now that's not necessarily our base case. So for now, I think we are in soft landing territory. There have been periods in the past, say the mid-1990s, where you had um, a period where the Fed planked aggressively, then they went on hold, cut a bit, and the economy did fine for about four or five years. Mm-hmm. It was only a what's called the dot-com crash, you know, five years later that you had a recession. And even that recession was fairly mild. Yeah, for Japan, um, Japan's been one of those markets where everyone's been waiting for them to hike. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, what they have done is they have adjusted one part of their policy, the so-called yield curve control, where they were, you know, pinning long-term interest rates in Japan close to zero. Then a year or so ago, they allowed that to essentially go up towards one percent, and they've essentially lifted that ceiling as well. Mm-hmm. So that's one type of timing they have done. What they haven't done is they haven't lifted their short-term policy rates. Every other country in the world has, but they haven't. And so there's a lot of speculation that they will this year. Inflation has been picking up in Japan. Wages have been picking up. And so all, all the ingredients are there for, for them to raise rates. So my sense is they will raise rates at some point this year. It could be in March. It could be in June. It's hard to say. Um, but they've been very cautious in how they, they do this. So I think in the end, they will hike rates. But they'll do it in a way where they won't allow people to price in too many further hikes afterwards. It's just their style of doing things is kind of exit from zero rates and then do it in a way where the market doesn't think, okay, now there's 100 basis points of price to go. The, the main issue for Japan at the moment is wages did pick up, but they've started to soften a bit recently. So everyone's waiting for the spring wage negotiations, which typically see wages jump up again. So that spring is really the big, uh, big period for, for us to get signal. Yeah, I think there's a couple of different things. You know, one is the inflation picture is probably the most important thing because if inflation stops falling and starts to rise, then suddenly everyone's narrative of this year changes. You know, it suddenly means Fed cuts or ECB cuts or bank billing cuts are no longer on the table. So that's probably the biggest, most important factor because that changes all the story. After that, it's really growth. You know, is growth generally going to hold up okay? You know, so we don't see a recession. The other ones are earnings. So US, if you look at US valuations, they're fairly rich. And so earnings are quite well priced. So if we get earnings disappointments over the course of this year, that would be a problem. Um, and then the other one I focus on is say China, you know, where um, the overall picture on China is quite negative. Everyone's expecting not much from China. If they are able to turn the picture around and suddenly you get a new growth engine for, for the world. Now our base case is no, they won't really do anything, but that's certainly a risk uh, to everyone's views on, on the positive side. Yeah, I think gold's a tricky one. I mean, sometimes it does behave like a safe haven, and other times it doesn't. Um, often it's very linked to the dollar as well. So the way I generally think about gold is there's three, say, three overall factors I look at for gold. One is the dollar. If the dollar's weak, gold is strong. The other one is interest rates, or real interest rates in particular. So if real interest rates are falling, uh, then gold goes up. And then the third factor is central bank demand for gold. Because um, they're a big, uh, you know, player in the gold market. So at the moment, you know, our view is the dollars on the stronger side, so that's bearish for, for gold. Real interest rates in general have been kind of going sideways, you could say. So that's giving you a neutral signal. And central central bank demand has picked up a bit. So between all of these factors, it gives you kind of a fairly neutral picture on gold. Now, if the dollar was to start to weaken, then suddenly the picture becomes more bullish on gold. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the thing people are probably not focusing as much on is the issue of kind of the level of debt that we have mm-hmm. in governments around the world and how that will be dealt with. Mm-hmm. So people were looking at the say three, four months ago, but all the conversations I have around that has gone mm-hmm. pretty much. Um, and I think it still is an issue, you know, how do you deal with too much debt. Mm. Um, so I think that's one, one, one issue I think people aren't focusing as much on. Um, I think the other one I think is probably um, China's uh, relationship with inflation around the world. Because if you look under the hood in China, what you find is that the production side of the economy is doing quite well, um, but the demand side is very weak. Mm. So you have this supply demand imbalance where they're producing too much mm. and there's not enough demand to consume that production. So that 
leads to deflation then. You know, they have to cut price, you have to cut prices then to balance the supply and demand. Mm. That's why inflation in China is very, very low. But then it also means that the world uh, inflation falls. You know, China's exporting deflation to the rest of the world. So I think that dynamic is very interesting as well. That's great. Right? Yeah, I would say they're they're creating more debt. They're not printing money so much anymore because they um, uh, are not doing QE uh, anymore. They're doing quantitative tightening. So the central bank itself isn't printing money; rather, the treasury just issuing more and more debt. That's okay. What's unusual in the case of the US is that the level of borrowing the US is doing, budget deficit, is very large uh, for an economy that's growing. Normally, the deficit is at this level when you're in a recession, which is what you would expect. Tax revenue goes down, the government wants to stimulate the economy. But the level of the deficit, the budget, sort of the annual outgoings, is in, like historically unusual for an economy that's growing really well. So if you were to see a recession, the budget deficit would get even larger mm-hmm. than the level you've never seen before. Um, now, the problem with this is obviously your overall debt load, the amount of debt you have outstanding starts to grow, and you know, who, who's going to repay this? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other issue is who's going to buy the debt mm-hmm. if you continue to do this. Now, at the moment, people are happy to buy US bonds, you know, partly because they think inflation is falling, so it's, it's good levels to buy, mm-hmm. uh, partly because people need treasuries for collateral. Mm-hmm. Uh, since the global financial crisis, uh, there's been big regulation to push people to collateralize their trading. So everyone's going to hold more collateral when they trade to cover margin costs and such. So treasury become more more in demand. Um, and then the other issue in the case of the US is that the US in some ways has been inflating away the debt problem, where inflation is high, and so that way uh, your nominal growth level goes up and allows you to reduce your debt to GDP ratio. So so you're using inflation to get rid of the debt as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean regional banks. Uh, it happened last year. My, my, my kind of overall sense is that the banking sector overall, while there will be mini blowouts here and there, because we had a big banking crisis in 2008, mm-hmm. policymakers are very sensitive to bank problems and they've regulated them so much that as soon as they sniff a problem, they'll come in and stop the banks from escalating. So I don't think banking will be the big crisis. Now, one area that could is private markets. They're much less regulated. So you've seen a growth in private equity, in private credit. I think all of those sectors could really provide some kind of risk to the overall system. Um, the, the other one is just inflation, simply. You know, if inflation picks up, uh, that means the central bank will have to raise rates, which will then crush the economy. Um, so so that, that, for me, is probably the biggest risk rather than the financial risk. Um, I would say uh, that real estate has done surprisingly well, you know, given you know, interest rates have picked up. I think that is partly to do with the fact that um, people aren't moving as much, you know, so they're holding on, so there's no selling. Partly also to do with the supply issue, no one's building houses. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is a very unusual situation that we're in. But overall, I think that real estate is probably not a good sector to be positioned in. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say is, you know, we touched on AI a bit, and I do think AI, there is something real within AI. And while valuation is maybe stretched, I do think AI is revolutionary in many different ways. Uh, so we're certainly doing a lot of work in AI on the machine learning side, on the large language model side. And I think one of the most interesting things, say on the chat GPT side, is that you can, there are ways for you to augment it with additional financial market intelligence so that it, it, it then can give you answers that are much more customized if you're financial markets. And so suddenly you could have this partner, a co-pilot, that can really help you make more informed decisions in the financial market. So I think we're doing a lot of work in that space and you know, hopefully we'll, we'll have something more sort of production ready soon. But I think that that's going to potentially be very powerful for investors going forward.